Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. Hey guys, 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 and welcome to another episode of Working Money, getting your money working for you. It gives me a little chuckle every time I hear it, guys. It is the fourth anniversary of Working Money Channel. Today, I officially have been doing this channel for four full years. Um, so happy birthday, Working Money. Enjoy your cake. Well, I don't have a cake uh, today, but if somebody wants to send me a cake, I would not turn it down. It's funny, you know, I was going through this, and uh, here's the edit um, I have up in the, uh, the edit suite. And uh, you know, I was looking at some of these clips, these older clips. Wow, 130. Do remember the time I had 135 subscribers? And when my icon looked like this, I found some uh, random dollar sign working out on the internet. Uh, some other interesting things that I noticed in this clip was, where was it? It was over... Well, one of them sounded like I was doing the intro like a cowboy. Oh, right, over here when XRP was up to $1.18. That was only about a year ago. Boy, have things changed. Because it looks as though the market has dropped. But before I get started into that, I guess I should do the intro for today. Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. There, okay, that's out of the way. So as I was saying, market has dropped a little bit uh, today. Bitcoin right now is trading at $27,400. We have seen the bottom getting kicked out of Bitcoin over the last day or so. But, uh, you know, the most recent low that we have seen for Bitcoin is about 25400 So we have not met uh, that level of support yet. Um, it has really beaten down the market. If I bring up XRP right now, it's trading at just under $0.35 cents as of the time of this recording, 0.348. Um, and so, you know, I was looking on Twitter, T analyst here was noticing this Bitcoin RSI weekly. So if we take a look at the RSI and we take a look at the bottom of former Bitcoin trends, uh, like the bottom that we saw in 2018, the RSI was about 29.13, uh, during the beer flu, when we saw Bitcoin hit that bottom in 2020, the RSI was about 33.33 and now it is at 31.93. So we are getting very, very close to that bottom there. If I bring up Bitcoin again, um, and you know, I'm not going to focus on the altcoins because they are just following Bitcoin at this moment. This is why, right? I'm keeping an eye on Bitcoin specifically. If you notice also, we still have not broken down past what would be considered the 89% rule. If I do a little bit of quick math here, you guys can see taking it from the top down to that bottom that we saw earlier last month at about $25,400 for Bitcoin. And we take another price tool and take it right from the top here all the way down to the top of that uh, of, of the former bull run back in 20 uh, late 2017 2018 take those two values and you divide them you get 89 percent so 63.06 .06 divided by 71.56 multiply that by 100 and it's roughly 89 percent and uh, i forget who came up with this but it was interesting because you know taking a look at bottoms in former bitcoin markets you can see that the same thing rings true like taking the top here bringing it down to the bottom right over here, brings us in at about an 84.19% correction. And uh, if you take that same top here, bringing it right down here to the top that we saw back in uh, back in December of 2013, you've got 94.1%. So, you know, just taking those numbers, 84.19 divided by 94.1 is roughly 89% yet again. And I don't have too much information on this chart, but uh, the same rings true uh, for this bull run as well. If you take this measurement, divide it by uh, the measurement that we saw for the high back before that, uh, it still rings true. It's about 89%, give or take a percentage point. So this is what we have. Bitcoin still holding above $25,000. I know uh, some people are wondering what the heck has happened to the crypto market. Crypto Whale here posting this. SEC confirms Do Quan has cashed out over $2.7 billion in the span of a few months prior to the Luna UST collapse. So here is some documentation just uh, noting some of those USDT outflows, okay? So he's cashing out in USDT coin and it looks like from several different exchanges, the Binance Exchange, KuCoin, Huobi, uh, OKX, so on and so forth. And um, so, you know, some people wondering down here, uh, you know, the fact that this has just come out, did this uh, contribute to the crash that we're seeing? Altcoin Daily also bringing this up. Do Kwon cashed out over $2.7 billion in the span of a few months. That uh, equated to roughly $80 million 
per month. And uh, if you guys want to read more about that, the link is down here. Uh, actually, I will create a different link here. I will uh, create a new tab here and create a new link for you guys because uh, this guy here, Fatman, at Fatman Terra, uh, really does explain it in uh, quite a lot of detail. So I will leave this here for you guys if you guys are interested. Um, so some people are really worried. There's also this thought that Tether could implode very, very soon. So uh, Crypto Whale also pointing this out. According to some insiders I know, some bad news about Tether is about to drop very soon. Just wait. Um, now, I don't know if you guys remember, about a week ago I did a video uh, talking about some leaked documentation from some Telegram groups and somebody was coming out, a whistleblower was coming out and saying, I did not know that the corruption ran this deep in crypto. Uh, a lot of people are going to be exposed, a lot of these projects are going to be crushed. And um, the, the most interesting point that they mentioned was the fact that, you know, a lot of people are going to really feel, emotionally feel, uh, very different about uh, crypto and, you know, what they believed in and what, uh, you know, the reality truly is. And so if you guys didn't catch that video, I'll link it up here in the top right hand corner. Um, so, you know, we're, we're starting to learn a lot about this. And I think because regulatory clarity has been front and center with regards to cryptocurrencies that we're all that, you know, we're starting to shine some more light on certain facets of the cryptocurrency industry that had been hiding in the dark for a very long time. The dude here also retweeting this, uh, or rather just posting a screen grab here from Eleanor Turret saying, an industry source tells me he has just moved all his stable coins from USDT over to USDC. So just along the lines of Crypto Whale's point here from his inside source, from an unregulated, um, some may say questionable stable coin to uh, USDC, which we know the government favors, he pointed me towards the one month chart for USDT, which shows it hasn't restored its peg in that time. Similar moves to UST before its implosion. So that is something to make note of as well, is the writing on the wall for Tether and, uh, you know, Tether, one of the most popular stable coins out there, uh, number three in market cap here, if I just bring up the coin market cap, with $72.4 billion in market capitalization, uh, coming in third, the fourth, obviously, USDC, with a significantly lower amount at $53.9 billion. So, um, you know, Tether has been the one that Bitcoin maximalists have relied on in the past, um, and, you know, there's been some controversy about it. I did uh, do a video about a year ago about Tether, and I'll link it up here if you guys uh, want to catch that. Um, so, you know, there's controversy. The market is moving in mysterious ways. Um, and what is going to happen to stable coins? We know that regulators are really trying to drill down on unregulated stable coins. So, you know, is this going to have an effect uh, temporarily on the market? Are we going to go below this mark here, which would negate the 89% rule? I know Rob Art over there on Twitter was, uh, you know, cheering on a $26,000 Bitcoin. So it sounds as though that's, uh, you know, the target he's looking at to get into uh, perhaps another Bitcoin position. But don't let it scare you away, guys. These are all temporary measures because we got to look at the bigger picture. And the bigger picture suggests that retailers, the majority of retailers, 75% plan to use crypto payments within the next two years. So again, short-term pain, for the long-term gain. We're going to still make moves to the upside. This brought to us by XRP Crypto Wolf here, uh, coming from ProCoinNews.com. A new survey published by Deloitte just indicated that roughly 75% of retailers in the United States specifically plan to accept crypto payments within two years. In fact, the larger retailers are already investing heavily in the technology infrastructure that is needed to make this happen, which indicates that mainstream adoption is already in progress. Uh, the data within the survey also continues to project that the percentage of retailers that will utilize crypto will continue to increase in the next five years. The retailers that were surveyed within the report include businesses from many different sectors of the industry, which include cosmetics, electronics, food, and home services. So it's not even just one uh, industry that is looking to move into cryptocurrency. It is uh, a multitude of different industries in the United States, particularly, and 75% of retailers, that is three quarters, three out of every four retailers in the next two years, this is what's projected, will accept crypto as payment. So if you're holding crypto today, if you're buying it at a good price, two years down the road, we see that price rally, um, and maybe inflation is also going up extremely at that point in time, because I mean, there's still no end in sight really for this uh, for these inflationary measures, at least not as of today. Well, at least if you purchase that crypto at a lower price, uh, you have safeguarded yourself for the future against inflation. I did a video on uh, Bitcoin inflation and that situation, 
No, that rhymed. Discussing how, uh, you know, the Bitcoin that I bought back in 2017, considering it is worth so much more today, uh, if I were to buy something today, and I think I used the uh, the example of a burrito, I did the math calculation and, uh, you know, based on the price I purchased at that time and based on, uh, you know, the day that I would have purchased uh, in the future, I would divide whatever the price is of the burrito by 13, and that's what I would actually have paid for that particular item uh, with $2017. So this is the whole idea of hedging against inflation with a deflationary asset like Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency. I mean, it doesn't really say which cryptocurrencies uh, these companies are going to accept, but I'm assuming Bitcoin will not be the only one. There was also this, guys, another one from XRP Crypto Wolf. Ripple Partner American Express announces first crypto rewards credit card on its network. So. These guys are a Ripple partner, and uh, you know they've talked about cryptocurrency integration in the past. Well, American Express has scotched hopes of a cryptocurrency-linked credit card anytime soon, the card giant has confirmed hints made earlier this year that it would be offering a crypto rewards program teaming up with digital asset service Major Abra. Announced Friday at Consensus, the Abra crypto card will allow users to earn back crypto on any purchase, no matter the amount or category. So they are offering this, realizing, uh, obviously, you know, following the statistics that we're seeing, you know, if 75% of businesses do decide to accept cryptocurrency, well, you know, American Express holders will have a leg up if they are receiving crypto back on payments. Here's a quote. This has been a long time coming and it is the first American Express crypto product, said Abra CEO Bill Barheit said in an interview with Coindesk. Amex retail offers from hundreds of merchants are integrated into the app with the whole fraud and, and uh, uh, purchase protection all integrated with the Abra wallet. So it's got to be regulatory compliant and, uh, you know, make sure all those KYC processes are taken care of before people can start paying with cryptocurrency. I can see what they're doing here. They want to make it difficult so that people who um, may be using cryptocurrency for laundering money, you know, the 0.001% of people that do that, uh, cannot, uh, you know, rook the system and uh, decide to utilize cryptocurrency to purchase all kinds of goods and services and, uh, you know, scam the system that way. There's got to be a process. And, uh, you know, I think we're getting closer to that. They're really kind of honing in on this. And, uh, you know, we're going to start seeing this more and more. So a Ripple partner now, American Express, starting to do this. I saw this piece of news too, guys, from the Wrath of Kahneman from a couple of days ago. MasterCard has also partnered with seven NFT platforms, including one of the Ripple X investments, Mintable. So this just came out. We've been innovating over the past year to make these improvements happen. As part of this work, we're happy to announce we're working to enable NFT commerce with Immutable X, Candy Digital, The Sandbox, Mintable, which specifically is the Ripple X project, uh, Spring, Nifty Gateway, and Web3 infrastructure provider MoonPay. We're working with these companies to allow people to use their MasterCard cards for NFT purchases, uh, whether that's on one of these companies' marketplaces or using their crypto services. With 2.9 billion MasterCards worldwide, uh, this change would have a big impact on the NFT ecosystem. So they are realizing NFTs are something that people want to purchase, but maybe you would more likely decide to purchase an NFT if, uh, you know, the payment process was a lot easier. And right now, if you can only use, uh, you know, cryptocurrency and, uh, you know, send crypto from your wallet to them, that might be difficult for other people, you know, the mainstream who hasn't really gotten into crypto at this point in time. So why not integrate with MasterCard in order to send crypto that way? Another great piece of news here. Wanted to thank the Wrath of Kahneman for pointing that out. So, I mean, I'm getting pretty excited, guys. I got to say, um, I don't know about you, but my entry is getting very, very close to execution. I'm still waiting for Bitcoin to actually go a little bit lower, I guess, uh, similar to Rob Art here. And I'm waiting to see more of an accumulation level in this zone here. And I'm waiting, you know, maybe another couple of months before we really start rallying up again. So, you know, I'm waiting for somewhere in here. Uh, certainly, if it goes below the 89% valuation uh, target, uh, which was which would have been this uh, you know this low of twenty five thousand four hundred for a bitcoin. Everything would be invalidated at that point, and uh, I, I I wouldn't know what to suggest to you guys at that time. I guess we would have to reevaluate. But um, you know, right now for bitcoin at least, if we see bitcoin kind of hover down and around here twenty six. Twenty-five, twenty-six thousand dollars. Uh, we'll see where altcoins are at because they will be following Bitcoin, as you guys can see. Everything's down right now. Bitcoin down four point two. Uh, we got Ethereum down over six percent. We've got Binance Coin about seven percent down. Uh, Cardano ten point four percent. XRP's down six point five percent. Solana's down seven point nine percent. So everything is still uh, essentially following the crypto market. That is good news for those who want to buy more because we can see that the world is shifting. 
Blockchain technology, distributed ledger technology, non-fungible tokens. These are just some of the new innovative techs that uh, we're going to see more prominently in the world in the coming years. But before we see it, guys, in the U.S., uh, there's still a few things that need to be straightened out. So, Stefan Hubert did some more digging, and he found some newly surfaced SEC filings with consensus. I can tell you one thing, it is bad. We've always been right, dozens and dozens of sham companies all registered with and rejected by the SEC at the same time. Consensus, uh, Anderson Horowitz, Galaxy Digital, and Goldman Sachs. So he just uh, posts some screen grabs here, just uh, linking these companies uh, to Consensus, Galaxy Digital. And uh, look at the names of some of these companies here as he points out. Texas Holy Smokers, Sin City Bad Babies Inc., uh, Seattle Emerald Haze, New England Cape Gods, Chicago Hog Mollies Inc., and uh, you know he he brings up a good he brings up a good point here. Where was it down here? He says you know in in what world? Just ask yourself why Goldman Sachs, UBS, Union Square Ventures, Wells Fargo, and Anderson Horowitz are investing together in companies called Texas Holy Smokers and Sin City Bad Babies. <laughs> Um, it seems a little ridiculous, doesn't it? So he's uncovered that. I'm not going to get into it in detail. Um, I wanted to bring this up to you guys from Wheezy at Nerd Nation Unbox. Gary was asked about the bill a couple of days ago, and this is how he responded about the, uh, the Loomis Gillibrand bill, which, uh, now I'm realizing is pronounced Lummis and Gillibrand. Anyway, listen to Gary Gensler here responding, uh, to this gentleman's question. Now, if I could follow up on crypto, th th these are general questions, Chair. So uh, just recently, a bill, I believe, has been floated by uh, Senator Loomis of Wyoming, Senator Gillibrand. Senator Loomis. Loomis, excuse me, uh, and Gillibrand of New York, uh, sort of broad outlines of regulation for crypto. And I guess the question is, you know, first, what's your broad impression? Second, just, you know, if you can't answer that, which is doubtful, but uh, what's your overall view on the need for regulation in crypto? Uh, and then how well the bill, from what we understand, divvies up responsibilities of regulation uh, to both the CFTC and, and SEC. How well do you think you can work together to actually execute on regulation? So, of crypto? so there's a lot you packed in there. And uh, I've had good dialogues with Senator Lummis and, and uh, I've known Senator Gillibrand for years and uh, certainly worked with her very closely in the Obama years, but I, th whatever comments I might have, I'm going to share with them, not with you and your audience now. And we, I really haven't reviewed their bill. It was released yesterday. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whatever comments I have, I'm not going to share with you and your audience. John Dean picked up on that. Every person who speaks to or interviews Gary Gensler needs to confirm this. Do not let him get off the hook by saying, I'm not going to speak on any specific tokens. Apparently he did speak on a specific token. He can say it to a senator privately, but not the public he serves. So uh, just a response to Jeremy Hogan's comment here from yesterday, I would certainly like someone to ask Senator Gillibrand when and how uh, Ch uh, Chair Gensler told her that Ethereum would be certainly commodities. And maybe someone could also ask Chair Gensler if that is true. That would be news to me. And uh, tagging Eleanor Turret there, Lummis and Gillibrand both agreed the U.S. Security and Exchange Commission Chair Gary Gensler's assessment that most cryptocurrencies are securities under the Howey test, with Gillibrand stating, most cryptocurrencies go to the SEC. We saw a clip on that yesterday. Bitcoin and Ether would be certainly commodities, and that's agreed upon. So it looks as though there was some agreement. That's agreed with Chairman Gensler as well as the chairman of the CFTC. So more damning evidence here, obviously, um, you know, suggesting that the Ethereum Foundation had or has an upper hand, um, you know, with uh, the SEC government officials, allowing it to have clarity, even though, um, you know, we know that um, it, it is a classic ICO. We, we've heard clips of, um, of Vitalik Buterin even stating uh, how they decided to sell Ethereum, uh, sell it for Bitcoin way back in 2015 or 2014 or whenever that was, and, uh, you know, fund the company that way. So there's, there's lots of evidence suggesting that Ethereum did pull a classic ICO move. Yet on the other hand, we have all these government officials stating, you know, and even in this new bill, which, uh, you know, I did a video just the other day, I'll link it up here. They, they talk about, you know, this idea that Bitcoin and Ethereum are the only ones with, uh, with certainty that are commodities. 
and that you know 99% of other coins, as we've heard multiple times, are going to fall in that securities category, which is going to be scrutinized by the SEC. All things that make us go, hmm, considering what is happening to Ripple right now and XRP. Perseverance, though, guys, it is perseverance, as per the bearable guy riddle, and I can see why now. Um, you know, it may not have been so terribly obvious back a few years ago, but, oh, man, when he said perseverance, I didn't think we'd be going through all this. Uh, okay, John Deaton here also mentioning, everyone in crypto should read footnote number five below. So another interesting observation here, in October 2013, Chris Larson met with various regulators to give a presentation at the U.S. Treasury Department, sharing with them Ripple's vision for a global payment system and cross-border payments based on blockchain technology. This was nine years ago, 2013. For those of you guys um, who want a little bit more detail here, here is the uh, here's the excerpt. In 2013, defendant Chris Larson, then CEO of Ripple, made a presentation to the SEC and other regulators about Ripple and XRP. Indeed, it is undisputed that the SEC admitted in response to RFA uh, 490 that representatives of Ripple met with uh, members of the SEC and other U.S. regulatory agencies on or about October 29th, 2013. Note that because you are going to be shocked as to how many agencies were at this meeting. The SEC, however, has improperly refused to answer all the RFAs relating to the October 29, 2013 meeting. That meeting uh, is important to defendants fair notice because it shows that from the beginning, Ripple engaged with regulators, including the SEC, about uh, XRP, yet the SEC failed to act for over seven years until the filing of its complaint in this action. The presentation deck that Ripple uh, used with the regulators at the October 2013 meeting, a copy of which the SEC employees who attended the meeting specifically requested and was provided Ripple on November 1st, 2013, described XRP as a currency, explained XRP's utility as a payment protocol, and described Ripple's ongoing distributions of XRP. Um, it goes down here in some more detail, guys, and I will link this in the description for you. The one thing that I did want to uh, point out, though, was that point in footnote number five. Where is it now? Footnote number five in this, uh, right, right down here. Okay, so bringing that up again, the meeting also had participants from guess where, guys? I'm going to just rattle them off here, okay? The Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the National Credit Union Administration, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Internal Revenue Services, the IRS, Conference of State Bank Supervisors, Federal Trade Commission, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, Office of Foreign Assets Control, Federal Bureau of Investigations, the FBI, and the U.S. State Department. So all of those organizations were at this meeting Footnote number five, thank you, John Deaton, for bringing this to our attention, um, because it's listed up here, including the SEC, and then that little footnote number five. I did not know that uh, it was more than just the SEC who was there. All these other governmental organizations were at this meeting, getting educated by Chris Larson about Ripple, about XRP, how it, uh, as they state here, how it is uh, you know, used as a currency, also how XRP's utility as a payment protocol functions in the distributed ledger process. So, SEC be damned, there are too many witnesses here who heard that presentation, at least allegedly, that could stand up in court and say, yeah, I was at that meeting. I understood exactly what Chris Larson said. So, you know, were any of Ripple... So now I guess my next question is, did Ripple's lawyers choose any representatives who attended this meeting to be their expert witnesses uh, in what they remember nine, all those years ago, nine years ago, uh, as to what they thought Chris Larson meant when he was discussing the XRP cryptocurrency, described XRP as a currency, and explained XRP's utility as a payment protocol. Are there more expert witnesses that we do not know about? All things that make you go, hmm... And just another quick shout out to all you guys who have been making Working Money Channel what it is. Thank you so much for four amazing years. Thank you guys, I couldn't do it without you. And uh, you know, for those of you who might not be subscribed yet, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.